Great, hello, um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming to this presentation today. Um, so today I'd like to talk about, well the title is Beyond Orchestration, the Cloud Native Runtimes Ecosystem for Performance and Security. Uh, my name is Alexander. Um, I'm from a project called Unicraft, we're an open source uh, library operating system. Today I'm going to make a comparison between existing runtimes uh, for the cloud, what they look like, um, what it kind of looks like to deploy a uh, runtime in the cloud, what it means for security and performance, and how Unicraft is trying to change the status quo of what it is to have a performant and a secure application in the cloud. So the themes that I've noticed over the last few days here at KubeCon, going through booths and going at lots of different uh, uh, talks, is that there's a lot of CVE scanning, package scanning, there's applications that are you know, we look at a particular item and then we have some system to introspect it. And we can do this in a number of different ways. And so there's also a number of open source projects that are doing this, but there are also a number of, you know, companies that are offering this as a service. And this is sort of the idea here is we're going to step back and kind of what's the problem here uh, in overall, right? In the sense that we are looking at a traditional system. Um, the other one is performance and how we tackle this. And again, it's a lot of introspection. It's a lot of, you know, there's some different themes here, like we have AI models to look at traffic detection and then we optimize that way, or we look at inside and we change the libraries, we compile them to make them more specialized. Um, or we have like slimmers, like there's Docker Slim, uh, Slim AI out of this. Uh, there are a number of ways that we can reduce what we have already to make it smaller and therefore more performant. And so overall in general, what we're doing is we're introspecting and we're looking at something and we're trying to find out ways to make it more secure and ways to make it more performant. Um, when we look at how we approach uh, the runtime of things in the cloud, um, there are a number of different sort of solutions that are lightweight. Um, if you look at some projects, K3OS from Rancher, Rancher OS, of course, this Linux kit and this uh, from VMware Photon, sort of a container runtime platform. Um, and these projects, they basically still rely on the traditional kernel stack. Um, and they still run on top of a hypervisor. And so what I'm trying to get at here is that both the security and the performance are reliant on a traditional fashion that is the large kernel hypervisor, uh, kernel, the large Linux kernel, right? Um, and there's a lot of problems with this particular stack, right? And if we look at the container runtime, container D, there's some new projects like libk run, runj, et cetera. Um, they're still sort of probing underneath it, the operating system. So you, as much as you're trying to tune this particular model, you're still reliant on a sort of flat base that is sort of homogenous across the industry. This is the Linux kernel, right? Um, the problem that I'm trying to get at ultimately is that there's lots of layers of indirection, lots of virtualization involved here, that you are so far away from your application. Your application is so far away from the, the metal that is actually running on. So your pod is usually containing an application. Sometimes this, you, know, it's, you can't even put two applications in it. You, like if you start a bash script and it you know, spawns multiple processes. Um, this is then separated by namespace, by the operating systems, container runtime, the container runtime is doing communications with the OS, and then finally, it's running on top of a hypervisor. Lots of indirection, and this is creating the problem here. This is the security that we have to look at now across many different layers, and there's the performance penalty of having all of those layers. Um, and of course, you know, the security part here, your cube system things mingling with your pods. So if we try and tackle the problem sort of at the lowest level, we try and reduce Linux or the, the, you know, the, the monolithic kernel that we have, we find that it's actually very difficult. And so we did a study where we looked at the dependencies between different modules inside of the Linux kernel. We use a program called Cscope. If one function was referenced in another module, then we counted that as a individual reference. And then you can see this sort of maze of graphs between major, you know, uh, subsystems within Linux. So it's very difficult actually to pull apart 
the Linux kernel, despite there being tools to optimize it, despite there being systems to try and reduce it further. Um, this is where I get to introduce to you the concept of unikernels. A unikernel is a way of approaching uh, looking at the deployment model for your application um, and rethinking about what we need to actually run the application truly. So if you look at the full stack application here, you have your application, of course, it's third lar party libraries and dependencies that you need for it to run. But then, of course, on top of it is the traditional stack that is the kernel, it's the operating system. Uh, this might be a distribution, for example. And then finally, it's sitting on top of the platform and hardware. Stepping back from the 30 years of research and development that's gone into Linux and to all other operating systems and picking apart the different parts that we need, we can sort of think about it as a library of OS kernel or, OS or kernel uh, uh, libraries, right? And you can pick and choose. And so the unikernel model is where you select the necessary libraries for it to become a kernel and then go through a process of building it and constructing it to result in what is a final unikernel binary image. The unikernel binary image has a number of different properties. It's something called compile time specialization, where you are taking your application and you're making it during a CI CD process, for example, more specialized towards its target. It is a lightweight virtual machine, so it is capable of booting by itself. It's if you think about compiling something with GCC or Go Build, it's a similar process where the end result is a binary that can boot, right? Um, in the same way that you have VM Linux. It has a single sealed address space, so there's no longer a separation between kernel space and user space. They're all one of the same, which means every syscall is no longer a guard between a permission check. It is just a, it's just a function call. So what was, for example, 300 uh, CPU cycles to make that check is now only a few CPU cycles. No syscalls, right? Um, it only does one thing. So there are no other uh, processes that are running at a single process. There's no SSH. There's no systemd. Uh, it is literally just your application. Um, and then it is also targeted directly for a hardware platform combination. So um, it will, if you're, you know, target for an architecture, uh, but then also for the hypervisor that it will ultimately run on, whether that's KVM, for example, or Zen, uh, VMware, Hyper-V, et cetera. So this is what Unicraft does. Unicraft is a unikernel development kit. Uh, we started as a Zen incubator project uh, around 2017. Um, and we're actually Linux Foundation, um, but we're trying to break in sort of into the cloud native space because it makes quite a good use case, for example, for lightweight uh, serverless functions, lambdas, etc. cetera. Um, so there's a little bit about our community. Um, so we started off as research. We have a lot of industrial partners, a lot of universities that uh, we work with, and a lot of contributors that are still um, with us. Um, the complexity, and so the next few slides are just a little bit about the result of building something as a unikernel. The complexity of your final kernel image is a lot simpler. It makes it a lot easier to debug, for example. So if you remember that sort of mesh graph that we showed before for Linux, this is that same program running now only for uh, Unicraft, and this is Nginx compiled uh, against Unicraft, uh, so it's now an Nginx unikernel. Then there's also just a hello world that just simply boots and prints the words hello world. Um, we did a performance comparison against Unicraft and then a number of other technologies. Um, of course, Docker um, running on container D and then Linux, bare metal, for example. This is, we you know, have a physical machine, we installed Linux, we ran Nginx on it, we pinned Nginx to a core and then in comparison. Here it sort of really demonstrates that the cost between jumping from the user space space, you know, it, if you're doing like a read or a write or you know, doing some I.O. path into kernel space really has a performance penalty. So there's an 82% increase in comparison compared to Docker. Um, memory requirements, of course, also go down. So Unicraft here on the far left, um, only using a few megabytes of memory that are required to run any particular application here, the different applications. Um, we also 
support a number of different virtual machine uh, monitors, uh, platforms basically. Uh, so we can run on Firecracker and here you can see that uh, you can boot a simple Hello World application and as little as 3.1 milliseconds so as a virtual machine. Um, just for fun, um, we were playing around with uh, edge devices, it makes sense. Um, it's given the sort of low resource capabilities. Uh, so this is on uh, Raspberry Pi, the amount of uh, time it takes to boot actually and get something to work. So here we have Nginx, for example, booting in only 92 milliseconds compared to when we installed Alpine Linux. And here we even you know, customized the Linux kernel so that it had, for example, um, security mitigations turned off. Um, so that there weren't extra guards in between uh, different process calls. A uh, little bit of comparison for CPU cycles and how long it takes. Uh, Linux and KVM, this sort of generally this 200 CPU cycles and then uh, Unicraft is a lot less because there's no uh, uh, check now between uh, the memory and user space and kernel space. Um, the transport is obviously now a lot smaller because you're no longer having to ship a full file system containing shared libraries with things that you might not necessarily actually use for your application. So if you looked at Nginx and we pulled the same version here, it contains shared libraries that are not statically linked against uh, the Nginx binary. So they're required and they contain functionality that you don't necessarily need. But with Unicraft, you literally compile all the necessary libraries that you need and then you can go even further. You can actually do compile time specialization strategies such as link time optimization, dead code elimination, et cetera. Um, as a result, there's a reduced attack surface. So you have no shell, there's no way to penetrate um, uh, sort of externally if there's exposed ports there. Um, we have the opportunity to specialize the, the memory so you can do ASLR and you can, every time you rebuild the kernel, you can make it uh, unique. Um, you get now the lowest level of isolation that is provided by to you, that is hardware, right? The virtual machine is still the standard unit of security in the cloud. Um, you still provision containers inside of uh, virtual machines and now you get actually this but without the overhead. Um, and then there's lots of specific um, CPU uh, security features that you can enable um, given a certain use case. Um, so we have a lot of ARM um, support. Um, we have a partner that uses it in automobile, for example, in an automobile use case, and they sort of adds additional security features uh, based on the ARM architecture. Um, and then actually as of today, we released a new tool called CraftKit, um, and it's a command line companion tool that helps you build uh, unikernels uh, quickly and easily. Uh, so the idea is here alongside the library operating system is that you have um, like a tool that basically let, lets you grab all the libraries that you do need and also you, you, know, you add a simple craft file to your repository. It looks a little bit like this. Um, you can then list all the libraries that you will necessarily need. You know, if you need TCP IP stack or if you need, this is new lib, which is a libc, which provides basic functionality uh, to your application. The idea is that you then go fetch those libraries with this tool called CraftKit and then just build it and out pops a unikernel. You can then also use the same tool to build um, different packages. So you can make it OCR, make it look like an OCR archive, or um, you can also then push it to a registry and then you can then use it uh, sort of in production. Um, our goal with Unicraft is to try and be the new unit of runtime um, so that people can leverage not only better performance but better security. And to do this, um, we want to introduce Unicraft into this ecosystem um, by making lots of integrations. And today I'm going to quickly go over one of those integrations. Um, and this is for um, running on Kubernetes. So there's a lot of tools out there that already allow you to run virtual machines, or manage virtual machines through Kubernetes. Lima is a new addition to the CNCF space. And there's also kubevert, there's kind of containers. Um, and they still rely, however, on the idea that you are running your container within a virtual machine. And so if you deep, dig deep dive into their source code, it still has this requirement to SSH into that virtual machine and launch a container, right? So it looks, you know, it looks like a pod, it shows up as a pod, it has all the right 
sort of characteristics of feeling like it's cloud native, but you're still managing this big bulky Linux kernel with a container inside of it. And so obviously you're still gonna have the um, negative effects of performance. And then by total implicitness, because SSH is required, you're now exposing an additional attack vector. So we investigated how best to approach making this integration. And to do this, one of the ways we can do it is with container D and by making the uh, unikernel look and feel like a container. And then that's by wrapping it in OCI uh, uh, image and using the OCI runtime specification. Um, so maybe you're familiar with Wonk. We're making something called RunU. Um, at a very high level, right, uh, this is uh, showing how we sort of connect between a controller node and a physical nodes or, or virtual, uh, you know, worker nodes. Uh, what's important here is the interaction between uh, the container runtime and the host. Um, so the rest of it is just exposing the right APIs um, so that contain, uh, so that uh, uh, Kubernetes looks and uh, sees things as pods or as services. Um, but we have to manipulate the host uh, itself be able to run the unikernel. So we have to install additional tools, um, and I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So this is sort of the only bit that needs to be changed, right, in the whole model. Um, so the basic process goes along where we have the Kubernetes control plane, which has a request to create a pod, and then goes to kubelet, creates a sandbox pod with container D, and this invokes actually something called a shim program, right? So basically a binary. Um, it accepts um, TTRPC requests, or it could also be gRPC requests. Um, and this binary basically invokes uh, a run something program, and then this invokes the ultimate uh, uh, like system that's creating previously a container, but in this case, a uh, unikernel. And so in the previous case, or in the normal case, it's invoking run C. Run C then starts a namespace you know, it's segment, it does truth, creates this file system for you, um, offloads everything into the file system from the OCI archive, and then starts the process with a given environment. Um, but this is where we inject ourselves in the whole process. We create a run u shim. The run u shim then invokes uh, the instantiation of a kernel uh, using whatever virtual machine monitor tool that you would like, for, exa for example, KMU or Firecracker. Um, it's very simple to install. You basically add one line under this prefix saying uh, this, and then it knows where to get uh, the uh, binary because you've also listed the binary name. Um, this is important because then you can then specify that you would like to run a unikernel as opposed to a container later on in your Kubernetes manifest. Um, then all you have to do is build a binary. This is so we built a binary called run u. It'll the, the interface is basically creating subcommands. Um, these are the subcommands necessary to start uh, an instance based in this whole lifecycle. And then these basically map to the uh, instantiation of a virtual machine. Um, so to then make the unikernel feel like it's a container, we used OCI, which is basically a tarball. And inside the tarball, you put things inside of it. Um, so we put the kernel, um, but that means that we're complicit with the rest of the space. It means we can put this um, unikernel into existing OCI registries. Um, we actually use a tool called ORAS, that they're here actually at KubeCon, um, that basically allows you to take arbitrary files and put them into the registry. And so if you follow the tree, you basically end up getting, this is what the binary looks like, its file name, and then you can also have an init RAM, for example. Um, the process here is that container D goes to the OCI registry, retrieves it, unpacks it, and then goes through actually CraftKit to then unbundle it and uh, have the file system where the unikernel is available. Um, and so the result here, so I showed you previously that they had this virtual machine and inside the virtual machine was the container. Here we now have direct access to the hardware. So this is what the model finally looks like. So we're still working on this. There's a lot of work to still do. There's still, uh, um, there, we're having regular meetings um, and we're sort of building more integrations with more cloud native 
uh, uh, tools. Um, so one of the things that we found was that the OCI archive specification was very limiting. It has, there's a lot of opportunity to put more metadata into the OCI archive. Um, for example, if you look at the specification provided by uh, the runtime spec, the runtime spec has very limited information about what the host is capable of doing. Um, you basically just specify, for example, that there's uh, an OS and what OS its name is, and that basically is a map of like Linux, FreeBSD, Windows, Mac, or something like this. Um, but this is very uh, close view of what's actually capable in the hardware. You could, for example, expose more information about what capabilities the hardware have, or what drivers are available, or what system services are available. Um, for example, whether you have a particular file system available to you or not, um, or how much of that file system. And of course, it also indicates what architecture it is, but it doesn't indicate, for example, which architecture extension it is, for example, for ARM. Um, so there's more information, uh, there's, there's a lack of information that we found with the OCA specification, and we'd love to be able to collaborate and find opportunities to make this more rich. Um, of course, with unikernels, since they're specialized services um, and their compile time specialization means that you can do, there's opportunity to make it even more performant or even more secure if you really know what is happening at the end. So unikernels usually find a good place in the edge where hardware resources are limited. But at the same time, um, if you are understanding what the scheduling of services might be, for example, if you're co-locating services, um, you could specialize those unikernels to be better co-located. For example, you could do shared memory pages um, by compiling a special library that then allows you to do shared memory, memory uh, rings. Um, so being able to tap in, for example, to the scheduling um, or the scheduler for Kubernetes, for example, and understand how it's going to schedule services could benefit um, unikernels but there's some open challenges here, like you have to pre-compile it, or, or you know, how does it, how, what does the deployment model look like? Do you put this into the OCI archive, for example? And then, of course, um, the same problem before about the host, like there's lots of opportunities to create uh, many permutations for a given uh, unikernel, um, in the same way that you have several permutations for a normal OCI archive for when you compile it against several different architectures. So this kind of is the result of the talk. Thank you so much for listening. Um, please do join our Discord or give us a star on GitHub. Uh, yeah, my name is Alexander, and I'm happy to listen to any questions and answer them. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. It's great. Uh, I have a question regarding like debugging and just logging in sure. general. So in this case, sounds like the unikernel just have very limited number of processes. And, and how, if I'm a user or developer, how do I debug or log mm -hmm. in things or metrics of the ability of this kind of thing? Sure. Yeah. So I mean, uh, with Unicraft particularly, um, we have a built-in GDB server. So if you wanted to like debug it, it would feel like a normal experience with you know debugging a program, um, and so this is if you're if you're you know debugging a compile time language um, such as C, Rust, Go, for example, you could use these features, and it would feel very normal to you. Um, but at the same time, you can also just debug it in a normal user space environment, um, and then the last step would be to compile it as a unikernel. Um, it's really only if you wanted to compile you know debug the the kernel itself. Um, and then for runtime languages such as JavaScript and Python, um, we have pre-built unikernel images for those runtimes. So you would just mount those files into a file system and then they would start executing in the normal way that you invoke you know, Python and then your, your program name. Does this answer your question? Is, is there a way, like during the runtime, can I be able to Mm. I guess I cannot access into the workload, right? So, so yeah. there's a number of observability systems that we can attach to Unicraft as well, such as Prometheus. Um, and then you get really fine grain access to the whole kernel and what's happening as well. So for example, you could look at the way the TCP IP stack is handling your load as well. Um, 
uh, it really depends on what you want to see and when. Um, if you want to just try and debug it because you're getting like a program error, um, it would be a different uh, sort of model here, maybe locally, as opposed to when you're doing it in production, then you would have you know, these monitorings exposed, in, as a, for example, as a library. I see, okay, uh, I have another question. So for the IO disk IO and network, mm -hmm. in this case, do you, and do you just add more like a kernel module? Like how, how do you enable, for example, but I O uh, network mm -hmm. and also sure. the disk I O. Yeah, so uh, Vert I O is supported a number of different Vert I O um, platform drivers, um, and so if you know what your target is, if you want to, for example, use KVM with Vert I O, you would then use those particular libraries. You would enable them. Um, we have similar. Have you ever seen like Make Menu Config? Uh, you open up a Make Menu Config. This is one of the configuration systems for Unicraft. It's Sky a config base, and you can go in there and select the different libraries that you want on the different platforms, and based on the platform you have selected, it will unlock other different configuration options that you can then set. Um, but there's a number of different file systems that we do support, 9PFS, for example, uh, this, um, so this goes over the Vert.io. Um, you can also run things in, in uh, init RAM. This is the most performant as a RAM file system. Um, so in that case, given normally you have this kernel space and user space isolation, but with unikernel, since you don't have that isolation, is there any that actually has security implication now with all these different uh, our protocols? Potentially the application can mm -hmm. more easily to explore that if there's any bugs in this protocol, right? So. When you are now building your application as a unikernel, you trust more the code base because you, it is only the few libraries that are necessary for it to be a virtual machine. You are no longer reliant on the full Linux kernel that has its vulnerabilities or it's, you know, it's, it, there's, there's ways to exploit this, for example. Um, but there are a number of security mechanisms that you can also enable, like um, UBSAN, KSAN, um, there's also specific uh, architectural uh, security features like uh, ARM PORF um, that you can enable for the unit kernel that add um, security or increase the security of the image at the end. Uh, you can also do image signing, for example, when you do transportation. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Uh, what are the most popular use cases for unikernels today? Yeah, so um, either uh, a, a cloud application, things that are usually high I.O., um, so web servers, caches, um, in-memory key value stores. Um, we also found that anything that runs on low resource usage, uh, low resource capable uh, devices, so closer to the edge, um, they perform very well. Um, but you can build, for example, your Golang application or Rust application in, like, normally and then make it a unikernel at the end and then you can run this. Um, we also support major cloud vendors um, such as AWS, GCP, et cetera. So you can deploy your unikernel as a virtual machine there and then you don't have to use as much resources as well uh, compared to running it as a full virtual machine. So you can save on costs um, compared to installing a traditionally bloated kernel then a container runtime, and, and then uh, your application, or just you know your application. Hi. Hi. Um, so you said that you support uh, major cloud providers. Yeah. Um, can I take that virtual machine and throw it in a Kubernetes cluster on any of these cloud providers? It's a good question. So some of these cloud providers do not offer uh, nested virtualization, such as AWS. But we are working on a mechanism that allows you to run, for example, an EC2 instance that's managed by a Kubernetes instance. So this whole workflow that I showed you with this container uh, uh, shim layer and you know, it's managing um, the uh, virtual machine monitor underneath, one of the ways we will extend this in the future is to be able to add support for cloud vendors, and so it would provision as an EC2 instance, and it would look like a pod still. Yeah. Makes sense, thank you. No worries. Any 
other questions? I think it's pretty much good. Perfect. Thank you so much.